everybody's doing okay. So just a couple more minutes before we start, I think a few more people may appear. My neighbors started doing something. It sounds more like um, scratching noises today. It's very peculiar. <laughs> and there's also a bit of a strange thing going on in my tummy. So hopefully it'll be uh, okay. But I've been to the loo quite a few times today. So I must have eaten something strange. <laughs> so I'm drinking this tea with a fair amount of caution, <laughs> hoping it actually stays inside. I'm not sure if there's any, anything that the Sheffield Insight Group would need to say or announce or anything. Okay. Uh, one thing came to my mind, just as I said that, um, for those who were not here yesterday is um, We'll probably say it again later but for the Q&A session later today um, you can also use that raised hands option which apparently is under the participants button or the reactions button um, and that way we'll be able to unmute you or you can write your question in the chat box but we do ask that you don't use the chat box until that particular session so that we can remain fairly quiet and within our own little inner world And uh, so, yeah, the schedule this afternoon, we're having a talk for about half an hour, a guided meditation, then some walking and some silent sitting. So that takes us to around 3.20. That's almost a couple of hours. So during that time, I'd really like to um, invite you to establish that continuity of mindfulness and um, see if you can go without having like a long tea break, maybe just get some water and sip on that. And then we'll have a tea break at 3.20 um, and some question and answers like yesterday. So that's quite a relaxed session. You can bring your tea, you can bring your blankets and basically ask anything you want, share anything you wish. Um, it doesn't always have to be a question. It can also just be expressing something you've experienced or discovered today. And then we'll end with a loving kindness meditation. And uh, for those who wish, maybe I'll mention now that um, on a Wednesday, I usually have a little chanting group at 5.30. We do um, the Loving Kindness Sutta, the Metta Sutta, and um, the same chant as well that I chanted yesterday, in addition to that. Um, and we dedicate those blessings to anybody who we feel might just need a little boost or to know that someone's thinking about them. And uh, so we bring those people to mind. So if you wish, everybody's welcome for that. Um, at 5.30. It's not part of this retreat, it's just part of my regular weekly group, so absolutely no, um, no need to come to that unless you feel that that's something that will support you. So It generally does support people, they feel kind of a little bit of uplift after chanting the Buddha's words. Some people are nodding, I'm glad that you're not shaking your head. <laughs> okay, well it's 1.30, so I guess we'll begin. First of all, I wanted to just show you the book that, um, because this is a book about emotions and emotional agility. I mentioned the author earlier, but I think I said Susan Davies and it's Susan David. So that's the book anyway. It's called Emotional Agility. And for anyone who wants to explore more about emotions, um, it's quite a nice one to read. I'm not sure she has any actual meditation techniques in there, but she does talk about how our emotions are such a valuable source of information that help to show us what we really value most in life. Um, and how, you know, having a full and rich emotional life is actually a great strength. So that sensitivity that I talked about earlier, you know, is often seen by society as some kind of weakness, but it's actually a huge strength. 
And they've changed the name now from highly sensitive person to high sensory intelligence, which I find really interesting because basically people who are sensitive and feel deeply, um, they process and take in more. They actually take in more information. So the danger there, of course, is with overwhelm, the possibility of moving into empathetic distress. Um, but if we can learn to manage those emotions, um, they also have a great strength within them, you know, in terms of maybe having greater intuition, having a natural sense of empathy and compassion. Um, because as soon as we get more familiar with our own emotional world, we're able to be more present and comfortable and at ease with other people too. You know, hold space for other people's emotions. So yesterday, for those who weren't here, um, there were three questions that we actually um, raised that can be kind of investigative, ongoing investigative inquiries for you. Um, so I wanted to share those straight away um, for anyone who hasn't heard that yet. So this was just a general invitation to investigate along these lines. So the three questions are, um, what am I doing? How is it affecting me? And where is it leading me? So this is really nice because we're always doing something which has an effect obviously on our mind and body. And we want to be sure that what we're doing is actually leading in the direction of peace, the direction of more kindness, friendliness, um, empathy, compassion, yeah, not towards resentment or stress. But there's another aspect of the path, which is even more important, I would say, that we've been talking about so far, which is where am I actually coming from? Where are my thoughts, my actions, my behaviours, my habit patterns coming from? What are they motivated by? And today I wanted to um, look at two suttas um, from the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha addresses this in relationship to thought. So thoughts are an interesting phenomena. We tend to give them a lot of value, um, often in meditation circles, meditators struggle with a lot of thinking or a restless mind. And we tend to see thoughts as the enemy in some sort of way that we have to like overcome, get rid of, push aside. But it can be very helpful to understand thoughts as simply conditioned mental phenomena. They're just, again, visitors to our mind. They arise from conditions and they pass away due to conditions when those conditions change or shift or end. So thoughts are not who we are. And yet we can invest so much reality in those thoughts, especially when we're unaware about how much we're identifying with them. And when we do give so much power to our thoughts, then those thoughts have power to create a lot of suffering for us or to create happiness if we learn to direct our mind and our thinking in wholesome ways. So thoughts themselves aren't the problem. And as usual with meditation, a lot of the um, so-called fight, let's say, and struggle can be overcome just by learning to relate to them in a friendly way. But in these particular suttas, the Buddha is also talking about using our discernment, using our wise discernment to recognize where these thoughts are coming from and where they're leading to, whether they're leading to our freedom and peace or to further bondage and suffering. So when we're able to distinguish between the thoughts that are for our benefit and the thoughts that are for our harm, then we have a little bit more um, influence over how we incline our mind, yeah? And also we start to learn what feeds thinking, what's feeding the negative, difficult, painful thoughts, and what's feeding the more positive, freeing thoughts in our minds. So we can put our energy in the direction that we want to incline. So without talking too much more, maybe one more sip of tea, if you don't mind. Ah, I want to get into the suttas. So the two suttas that I'm going to talk about today are Majjhima Nikaya 19, it's called the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, and the next one, Majjhima Nikaya 20, called the Vitaka Santana Sutta. And the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, the first one, is really interesting because it categorizes thoughts in two ways. And this is more looking at, you know, where those thoughts are coming from, whether they're motivated by wholesome roots or unwholesome roots. So this is the first stage in starting to understand our thoughts. 
so the Buddha says here, and this is the Buddha, right? The Buddha with the most incredible capacities and, and qualities and, you know, potential for awakening. Before he was awakened, he already had so many um, incredible qualities. And yet the Buddha too, before he was the Buddha, so the Bodhisattva, <clears throat> also struggled with thought. So he says here, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and lay men and lay women, whoever was listening. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. So that sounds simple enough, but actually this is huge. <laughs> because we're already recognizing that there's a very big difference between those types of thoughts, depending on where they're coming from. And for those who know the suttas fairly well, you might recognize also that the second type, the ones based on renunciation, non-ill will and non-cruelty, exactly correlate to the three right intentions, the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Yeah. So that second factor of the Eightfold Path is nekama, non-ill will and non-cruelty. In other words, letting go, making peace, yeah, loving kindness and compassion. So thoughts with those kind of wholesome motivations are quite different. But it starts off by just recognizing what kind of thoughts we're having. And then, of course, he took the next step and, and looked at these thoughts in terms of where they're leading. So he says, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. So that's just mindfulness, knowing what's arising. And then this leads to my own affliction, to others affliction and to the affliction of both. So you see, the Buddha's always concerned, not with whether it's bad or he should or shouldn't have that thought, but it's causing suffering. You know, it's causing suffering for himself, for others and for both. So that stimulates the motive of compassion. And then further, he says, it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana. Mm -hmm. So here we're starting to understand where we want to go and whether or not the way we're thinking is actually taking us in that direction. So it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana. That's also very similar to the um, description of the five hindrances. They also obstruct wisdom. So thoughts are often fueled by the hindrances, in fact. Then he says, when I considered that this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. And when I considered that this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose, I abandoned it, removed it and did away with it. So this is quite interesting because he's saying that he abandoned, removed and did away with it. But actually what happened was he just recognized its nature, realized it was leading to harm. And because of that, it subsided. So he didn't actually have to do anything. It was all caused by compassion and wisdom. And then that led to the stilling of that thought. Of course, there can be a time span involved, so we can't expect always to like see that thought, relate to it kindly, and then it just vanishes, you know, especially if it's a habitual pattern that we've been sort of following for a long, long time. But I think, you know, once we do start to see what's for our benefit and what's for our harm, it can take away a lot of the um, uh, investment in that thought. Sometimes we're thinking these thoughts without really realizing what we're doing to ourselves and how we're building suffering. And of course, our thoughts also reinforce our emotions, right? For example, you might have a feeling of anxiety arising. And because of that, the thought comes, oh, you know, I'll never be able to do anything. I used to think I'll never be able to give a public talk because I'm just too shy, I'm just too nervous. And that led to some sadness in me. 
And because of that, of course, you know, the anxiety is more of a problem, right? And so the two things just keep on fueling each other. When actually, when you can just step back and say, oh, look, it's anxiety, it feels like this. It's like uh, this sensation in my tummy. And I actually started seeing it more like a kind of adrenaline and also recognizing that the anxiety was um, actually coming from a place of caring to serve, you know, actually wanting to do my best, wanting to offer something of value. And then it helped me to embrace that. And now, I don't know, I, I don't really feel it very much, actually. But if I do, it doesn't concern me at all. In fact, sometimes if I come in without any of that sort of anxiety or slight adrenaline, sometimes things seem a bit more flat. So I've learned to embrace it. And that really helps. So, and that the same thing, the same pattern goes for the thoughts of sensual desire, for thoughts of ill will and for thoughts of cruelty. So just recognizing that these are not the thoughts I want to follow, that these lead to affliction for myself, others and both, and that they obstruct wisdom, cause difficulties and lead away from Nibbana is the first step. And then, of course, he goes into the opposite. So now he's talking about the three types of thinking with the right intentions or the wholesome, let's say, wholesome and ennobling uh, motivations of mind. So he says, as I abide a diligent, ardent and resolute, a thought of non-ill will arose in me, a thought of non-cruelty arose. Um, oh, yeah. And a thought of renunciation. Then he realized this thought of non-cruelty has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction or to others' affliction or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom. It does not cause difficulties and it leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought for even a night, even for a whole day, even for a day and a night, I see nothing to fear from it. You know? So this is when we're in a really wholesome feedback loop, for example, thoughts of gratitude or thoughts of kindness or, you know, maybe thoughts of the Dhamma that uplift the heart. Thoughts about perhaps, you know, taking more steps on the path, thinking about ways that we can prioritize what matters to us in life. Those kind of thoughts can be really uplifting. So he says that he doesn't see anything to fear from that. But then there's a caveat because there is one little thing to fear. He says, but, with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from stillness. So basically he's saying here that um, these thoughts are wholesome. These thoughts are part of the path. Um, you know, there's nothing, it's not going to actually create difficulties for us, but the only danger is that we might get tired if we think obsessively about anything, right? And uh, I've noticed for myself, I was on retreat in Perth a couple of years ago and actually through following my teacher's instructions properly for once, <laughs> I actually stopped messing about in my meditation. I stopped trying to fix anything and I just did nothing, actually nothing, and went into quite a lot of sleepiness for a few days, as he <laughs> told me to expect. And then when I came through that sleepiness, my mind was still in a very, very passive mode and the breath just appeared and quickly became full of bliss, actually, because my mind was really poised. It wasn't too agitated, nor was it dull any longer. It had literally sort of come through the clouds and just woken up of its own accord and found some kind of balanced energy and effort there um, without much of a sense of self involved, without much of this thing that Ajahn Brahm calls the doer sticky fingers that want to manipulate and control our experience and my mind just went into this state which was very quiet for many days you know hardly a single thought and um it seemed so effortless I sort of thought to myself how come well afterwards I guess I must have thought this <laughs> um how come this hasn't happened before or how come usually you know thoughts are there even if there's long periods of silence thoughts are always there somewhere not too far away um, and it was interesting because when I, that, that, the conditions for that naturally passed away after some time, and when the thinking started to come back again, I noticed that even a little bit of thinking actually tired my mind and I needed slightly more sleep. 
It was really interesting and not thinking in any sort of negative way, just just a normal sort of light amount of clouds wafting in and out of the mind that don't really distract. But still, I noticed it tired my mind. It tired even my body. So I needed like an extra half hour or so of sleep. So I can understand here what he's talking about. And and um, and remember with these suttas that we're starting from kind of the very beginning of the path, but also leaning towards deep states of samadhi and, and liberation from basically all thought eventually. And so the Buddha here is concerned with taking that further into the deep states of stillness. So he said that when he realized that even that much thinking um, caused tiredness in the body, he steadied the mind internally, quieted it, quieted it, brought it to singleness and stilled it. And then this is the sentence I really love in this sutta. He says, um, monastics and lay people, whatever one frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of their mind. And this is just so wonderful, isn't it? Because we realize that we're creating our mind, we're creating our world through our thought processes. And in a way that can be quite scary, but in another way that gives us enormous um, sense of relief that the mind is malleable. Yeah, that the mind can be directed in wholesome uh, ways and that we're not just a victim of our thinking mind. Yeah. Basically, our mind is conditioned just as thoughts are conditioned. The very nature of our mind is also conditioned. You know? And depending on our habit patterns, we have certain kinds of thoughts. So, for example, if somebody suffers from, say, low self-esteem or... Um, maybe has an envious or jealous kind of mind or let's say mental state arising frequently, then they're likely to have thoughts which are around comparing themselves with others. Right? So it works both ways. Noticing kind of where you're coming from, you can see that that influences the way you think, but also noticing the content of your thoughts can give you clues about where you're coming from. So if you notice you're always comparing yourself with others, maybe this is a lack of, uh, maybe this is a sort of type of envy or jealousy that comes perhaps from not really um, rejoicing in another person's success or perhaps not rejoicing in yourself and what you have going for you. Sometimes envy is actually a lack of gratitude, I think. You know, we're always looking at what we don't have rather than what we do have and valuing what's right there. So... I mean, this is just going through these suttas fairly quickly. So that's the first one. And I would say that the emphasis there is seeing where we're coming from and where it's leading us to. And then the second sutta is called the Vitaka Santana Sutta. And this comes afterwards because once we've already understood where we're coming from in our thinking, he gives us some methods to deal with distracting thoughts. He gives us some methods some concrete ways. And the title of this is actually, it says here the removal of distracting thoughts, but literally it's actually the removal of thoughts or the stilling of thoughts. Because, and I think in the Chinese, this is called the Adichitta Sutta, which means the Sutta on the higher mind. And the higher mind is actually a synonym for jhanas, deep states of meditation. So I would say that this Sutta is looking towards um, working skillfully with thoughts, developing and purifying our minds with wisdom again and compassion, but also bringing our minds to the state where they, it is really still and the thinking actually subsides so that we can, you know, watch the breath effortlessly and actually move into these deeper states of samadhi where thinking completely stops for some time. Yeah. So it sounds maybe like an impossible thing, but it's not impossible for the thinking to stop. However, it will never happen through force or willing it to happen. It will only happen through learning how to work wisely with our mind. So this is called the Vitaka Santana Sutta. And in here, he's giving five methods of how we can work with our mind. And also it's important to point out that these methods are sequential. So the first one is the first sort of go-to method. And then if that doesn't work, we go to the next and then the next and then the next. 
but just by presenting this to you, I hope that you can find something that maybe you already do or that speaks to you or maybe even offers a different perspective on how you can work with your mind. And again, don't feel you have to remember anything or certainly not everything. You can always go back to the texts. So the first method here, when one is giving attention to some uh, sign, it really means some thought, okay, in this case. Oh no, sorry, it doesn't. It means object, it means object of meditation, okay, because it's a bit of a strange language sign. Um, it just means whatever you're aware of, okay, owing to giving that object attention, there arise unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, with hate and delusion then one should give attention to some other object connected to what is wholesome. Then when you give attention to another object connected with what is wholesome, any unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate and delusion are abandoned and subside. And then he gives a lovely simile. He said, it's just like a skilled carpenter or their apprentice might knock out, remove and extract a coarse peg by means of a fine one. So too, when we give attention to some other object connected with what is wholesome, the mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and stilled. And in here it says concentrated, but it's just the wrong translation for the word samadhi, which is stuck, unfortunately. But, you know, if we're quietening our mind, bringing it to stillness, bringing it to singleness, we're not concentrating it, we're actually settling it, right? We're actually letting things all settle down. So stilling it is a much better translation which feels also more expansive to me and much less contrived. So that's the method of substitution for short. And some examples are, you know, say ill will arises in the mind, like you're thinking about a person in a negative way, or maybe the inner tyrant has got hold of you. Have you heard of the inner tyrant? <laughs> I bet you know what it is, even if you've not heard of it, because it's just this negative dysfunctional pattern of thoughts, which really undermines ourselves and any positive attributes that we have you know it's that kind of um voice that just says oh you're never going to get it right you know you'll never be good enough you'll never be loved you know really painful patterns of thinking that actually don't serve us in any way at all so sometimes the thoughts that we have towards ourselves are full of cruelty and ill will and then this first method would uh, recommend that we substitute those thoughts actively. So of course, again, first we have to catch it, see that it's coming from ill will, it's coming from cruelty, and then say, okay, how can I talk to myself in a friendlier way? What about, hey, you know, you're doing your best. I really understand that it's not easy for you right now, but I trust you, you've come through this before, you'll do it again. And many people love you, many people value what you do. Write it down if you have to, you know, just to get that reality check. Because again, it's when we believe in the reality of our thoughts that they really have this power over us. And thoughts are not facts, right? Thoughts are actually very far away from the truth. The truth can only really be understood in silence. Thinking just adds on, it constructs our world. It constructs a kind of fantasy world that doesn't really exist. So that's one example of overcoming that ill will with, you know, speaking to ourselves kindly with compassion. You know, another practice, of course, if you see there is a lot of tendency for aversion in the mind, negativity towards whatever it might be, sensations, emotions, even the breath, we might choose to practice metta, you know, regularly, as I suggested yesterday, in the morning and in the evening, but also, you know, as, as a practice in and of itself. You might want to give whole sessions to meta meditation or maybe end your sessions with some meta meditation, sending out thoughts of loving kindness to yourself and to the other beings in this world. You can even substitute the thinking with periods of silence. I'll try that on you in the meditation, noticing the space between the words, just noticing that yes, there's thinking, but there's also silence in the mind. So we're shifting what we're aware of in that case. And then there's loads of other possible examples. Yeah, one, one that's worth mentioning is um, when we do the meta practice, we often start by using a whole sentence. Yeah. 
but you'll notice as the mind calms down and as you get more in contact with the emotion of loving kindness you need less and less words so you can actually drop it down from may i be happy just to happy and it just inclines the mind very gently in that direction in that wholesome direction which is a direction of wishing yourself well um, so that the thinking actually can start to calm so you can substitute a whole sentence for one word in that case and then the next one is um, also quite an active method and it's called examining the danger so let me see if I can read it out in a way that's concise. So yes, he says, if, if we're doing that and there still arise thoughts connected with desire, hate and delusion, we should examine the danger in those thoughts. These thoughts are unwholesome. They are blameworthy. They result in suffering. And then when we reflect on the danger in those thoughts, those unwholesome thoughts subside. So I wrote down a few little examples and um, yeah, the first thing is to examine the danger, but not by berating yourself or saying, this is terrible. Look at all these terrible, unwholesome, dangerous thoughts that you're thinking. It's more to just see what you're doing. And for me personally, I quite enjoy my thought process, especially when I meditate, because it's quite interesting. <laughs> and I tend to be, I don't know, quite creative. I'm sure it wouldn't sound that way if anyone could actually hear my internal monologue. But um, sometimes it can be quite sobering for me to realise that those thoughts are actually not really leading anywhere useful, because at times they do seem quite important. So the first thing that I reflect on is that they do waste time you know, and that they do waste energy also, as I said before, they do tire the mind. They're usually not that clear, because most of the time when we're thinking, we have the hindrance of restlessness going on, right? That's why we're thinking. So even if it's subtle, and even if those thoughts are about the Dhamma, there's still a bit of restlessness there that won't let the mind completely still. And as long as there's restlessness, we're not going to be able to enter the states of the jhanas. Um, and it's not that you just enter them for the sake of saying, hey, you know, I can get into deep meditation. The whole purpose is to overcome the hindrances for long enough to see things as they are, to see things clearly so that really deep wisdom can arise. So we're basically blocking off that wisdom. If we're always involved in the contents of our mind, we're actually one step away from the experience that's happening right now. Um, there's actually something in the suttas called Dhamma Vitaka as well. Um, and it is when your mind gets very clear in meditation and quite bright and quite inspired even. And you start kind of giving yourself a Dhamma talk. <laughs> I bet some of the old meditators here have had that experience. It starts to become so clear and you make all these connections between this sutta and that sutta and what it means to your life and how you can see it manifesting in, in the world. And, <laughs> and you give you, you have all these like really nice phrases coming up and, uh, and, you, get, and you think, well, this must be good. But again, it's actually considered by the Buddha as the lasting obstacle before getting into deep meditation. It's almost like Mara's last attempt to keep you in the world where you can be controlled. <laughs> so Mara in Buddhism is um, this kind of personification of like the control freak, basically the control freak in chief. And Mara actually is a deity, is a deva that comes from a different um, realm, quite a high realm, but it's the realm that wields control over others' formations. <laughs> Sounds a bit archaic, but basically it's that aspect of the mind, if you want, um, that wants to be in control, that wants to know what's going on and that doesn't want to completely let go. Because if you do enter into the deep samadhi states, they say that that's where Mara cannot find you. Because this doer, this controller within ourselves has been almost like knocked out for a while. Um, and you're just basically very, very still. It's almost like you're hiding from Mara. So the defilements can't come in either, right? You're completely protected from any kind of ill will or unwholesome qualities. And certainly no thinking can come in there. So you're outside of Mara's control. So, and then just something that Ajahn Brown says, you know, he always says silence is so much more productive of truth than thinking. And again, you know, we just, thoughts can only be very poor approximations of reality at best, right? 
and we have so many different thoughts about the world depending on our mood we can see how constructed how unreliable they really are and yet sometimes if we're in a pattern especially if it's a pattern that we're used to having and that we've been brought up with perhaps it just seems so real so it's really helpful to realize that thoughts are not reality thoughts are actually keeping us one step away from experiencing the truth which is of course why we have so much emphasis in the practice on experiencing the body first of all then experiencing the breath because these are very tangible things that are almost beyond the world of language and then the next two which i'll try and quickly cover because we're going over as usual um a slightly more passive i would say the substitution and examining the danger involve a little bit of you know active discernment but the next two are a little bit more subtle and that's why they come next, of course, because our mindfulness hopefully is growing by then and we have some understanding of how to work with our thoughts. So the next one is to forget or ignore or not give undue attention to that thought. So, yeah, in here, forget those thoughts, not giving attention to those thoughts. So this is like allowing the thoughts just to be there and just not make any problem out of it. You know, maybe perceiving them like like clouds that are just passing through the sky or even winds that pass through the sky. You don't know where they come from. You don't need to know. You don't need to know how long they're going to stay or when they're going to pass. They're there, but your mind is somewhere else. You know, it's almost like they're at the edge of your screen of awareness, but they're not slap bang in the center. And again, this works with silence as well. If you actually give value to the quiet moments, give value to the stillness, the silence, the space, then those thoughts just don't have as much energy to them. You're not investing them. You're not feeding them with fuel. Yeah. So we can just let those thoughts kind of uh, fall off in a way, fall off the screen and guide our mind to where its benefit really lies. So guiding our mind towards the peace that we might experience. That peace can be experienced even among the storm, even within a storm. Yeah, You might be having all kinds of emotions going on, but as long as you've tried to relate to them with kindness, there may come a point where you feel, yeah, they don't really need my attention anymore. Now I'm going to just gently incline my mind somewhere else and get a more panoramic view. So we can actively value, give value, give attention, nourish the silent spaces in our minds. And then the last one is quite a, well, this is not actually the last one. The very last one is using will, using force to overcome the thoughts. But I always um, skim over that really quickly because that's not really advisable unless you're about to actually do something harmful or unless it really is the last resort and you've tried everything else. You might have to just say, no, I will not think that. For example, if you have thoughts of harming a person or harming yourself, you just want to say, no, I must not follow this thought. You know? And say that with firmness, not with negativity, but understanding where your benefit lies. So the other one I want to give more attention to is the fourth, and this is called stilling the for thought formation, which is very interesting because it's not actually dealing with the thought itself, but looking at where that thought's coming from and stilling that place. So Bhikkhu Bodhi causes, calls that place the cause of thinking, stilling the cause of thinking. But Ajahn Brahmali, one of my other teachers in Perth, Ajahn Brahm's um, second monk, really, he calls it the will to think, stilling the will to think. And that's interesting, too, because it's actually called um, Vitaka Sankara Samatha. So Sankara does mean kind of the will, volition, yeah? um, that thing which wants to think in the first place. As I said, Ajahn Brahm often refers to that as the doer. Not that there's a being there that's called a doer, but the doing part of the mind that just wants to be involved. Yeah. And you will see if your mind does get into some stillness, when the thoughts come back again, it's a kind of stirring of that sense of self, that sense of self that does and that controls. Um, yeah. And then the Buddha gives a nice analogy for this, which might help because this is um, a method that nobody's altogether clear about some discussion about let me have a look 
so he said so he he gives an analogy he said just as a person walking fast might consider why am i walking fast what if i walk slowly and then they would walk slowly then they might consider why am i walking slowly what if i stand and so they would stand and then they'd consider why am i standing what if i sit and then they would sit then they'd think why am I sitting? What if I lie down? And then they'd lie down. By doing so, they would substitute each grosser posture for one that was subtler. So too, one gives attention to stilling the thought formation, or if you like, stilling the cause of thinking, or stilling the will to think. And then the mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and still. So that's interesting, we go by degrees, we slow things down gradually. So at first you might be just contacting the thought, understanding where it's coming from, is it for your benefit or not? Perhaps working with it and trying to substitute one with another. But after a while, you just notice the thoughts arising and you start to catch it earlier on, yeah? Sometimes, I'm sure you've probably noticed this, sometimes you can feel it stirring almost before it actually manifests into words. And I think they're talking about that place, that sort of bubbling up and stilling that, seeing that it's coming and just not following it. Remember that stilling isn't always active, it's sometimes just being aware, noticing it coming and just not following it, just letting it kind of fizzle out. And so this is really, really helpful in the path towards samadhi because as we practice more and more by just being with the breath, everything starts to calm, the breath starts to calm, the thoughts start to calm. And more and more we can actually start letting go of that controlling, that doing, that part of the mind that wants to kind of know exactly what's going on. And we can just really allow this process of stilling the mind to unfold, yeah? Of course, here you have to start off with beautiful, pure intentions. It can't be an intention for getting into jhanas or, you know, getting spiritual brownie points on the path. It must be coming from gentleness, compassion, kindness. And then we can really trust that we're in the right direction. And I'll, I just want to end by quoting something that uh, is very beautiful that Ajahn Brahm often quotes as well. Um, and this is about the path in general. Yesterday, we started off the um, first session by talking about um, this person, Rohitta, who wanted to travel and walk to the end of the world. And the Buddha said, you know, the world can't be, the end of the world can't be found by traveling, by walking. So far, you'll never come to the end of the world. But the end of the world is within, within this fathom long body. The end of the world is here within this body and mind. So we look inside, we don't travel outside. But here, this is from the Visuddhimagga. Um, it's actually saying that we don't travel at all. There is actually no traveler, ultimately. So this phrase is, the path is, but no traveler on it is seen. Nibbana is, but not the person who enters it. <laughs> so little by little, we give up this sense of identifying with a permanent self. And we learn to just allow the Dhamma to unfold within us. Yeah. confident that if we're pointing our mind towards wholesome states, if we're coming from these beautiful right intentions, then we are on the path. And it's just a matter of having patience and trusting that the path leads to beautiful, peaceful states of mind. So that's enough on that. <laughs> it's really unfair isn't it I feed you with all this stuff to think about and then now you have to meditate and still the thoughts <laughs> yeah but no there's no particular outcome we're looking for in this practice so just settle into your body into your place and ask your body as usual where and how it wants to sit and can I check before we start whether the noise in the background is um, loud? Is it obscuring my words? No. All right, that's great. Thanks for the positive feedback. Um, my voice does tend to drop a bit when we do the guided med. So far, has it been okay? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. You're all very responsive. That's so lovely. <laughs>
So I'll, I'll still give us the half hour. <laughs> And as usual, anything that I suggest is just a suggestion because I have no idea, no psychic powers about what's going on in your mind. Just wait for everyone to settle a little bit. Absolutely no rush at all. One of my teachers, Ajahn Brahmali, he always says that, I don't know if he's ever put a percentage to it, but from his teachings, I'd say, it looks like he considers 80% of the path, the foundation, the virtue. Similar with the meditation, much of it's just the preparation, setting up the body and mind. So meeting your inner world again, just see if you can greet it as a friend. Someone you've perhaps not been acquainted with for the last while. And really just checking in to see how you are. How is your body? Is there any information that your body's giving you as to how it wants to sit? Or lay down? You might imagine your body like a vessel of water. And as your awareness and kindness come in contact, it's like adding a drop of ink to that water. That awareness and kindness, kindfulness, starts spreading out in every direction. Slowly colouring all the water in the same hue. Filling it up. Reaching every little part, every nook and cranny. From your head. Through your eyes, nose. All the sense organs in the head. All the way through your torso, shoulders, arms. Flowing through the inside of your body too. And just noting if there's any areas which appear to have no sensation, just resting your awareness there and moving on. Through the legs, hips, buttocks. down to the knees, ankles, 
heels, soles and toes. If you wish, you can also move your awareness up again through each part of the body to make sure no area is left out. Noticing the space between each toe. Fold behind your knee. Places you rarely give attention to. See if you can include all that in the field of your loving awareness. And if you are able and your mind feels ready, you can just get a general sense of the body's whole energetic field. Noticing the skin, the area that circumscribes the body. Touch of the skin against your clothes or against the air. Just body sitting. Not me, not mine, not a self.
And within this field of awareness, you may notice emotions passing through. Maybe thoughts arising, staying for a while, ultimately passing away. See if you can maintain this unconditional awareness. That allows everything to come in, but clings to nothing. Recognizing all phenomena arise due to causes. And pass away when the causes cease. What arises is not my problem, not my business. My business is just to make peace. To stop the struggle, stop the fighting. And if you find that any thoughts are getting sticky, or feel very solid and disturbing, just check whether that thought is motivated by desire, ill will, or cruelty. whether it leads to your well-being and ease or whether it leads to your affliction, to the affliction of others or both. Without judging yourself for thinking that thought, just noticing the habit pattern of the mind at this moment. And not believing in the contents of those thoughts. Trusting your mind to abandon whatever it doesn't need.
If you find that your mind feels negative or upset, you are struggling with the practice or with an emotion that may have arisen. Maybe try sending yourself some loving kindness, some thoughts of well wishing. Such as, may I be happy. May I be free from suffering. May I be at peace. Speaking to yourself kindly, offering assurance and encouragement to your mind. Perhaps if your mind is already fairly quiet, you can simply incline towards that silence, that peace. And check out how you're relating to the silence, to the peace. Is it also with unconditional awareness, with loving kindness, without clinging or a desire to make it stay? What happens if you just gently allow yourself to sink in to those quiet spaces in the mind? to trust in this inner peace, however subtle it may be. Allowing everything else to fall off your mental screen And as your mind gets subtler, you may notice the subtle object of the breath. It's 
See if you can greet that breath as another very precious friend. So it seems I was muted. I'm not sure if anyone heard my voice, but maybe you're just following the path of peace, making peace with whatever arises in your mind. Noticing the silence in the body, the silence of the breath. So noticing any peace, any relaxation, 
that's developed in your body and mind. Understanding how that came about. What did you do that softened the craving? Any aversion or roughness in the mind? What did you stop doing? How do you feel now? So just savoring any sense of calm, relaxation, brightness, spaciousness in the mind. Staying connected to that experience within as you gently open your eyes. And we're going to move into some walking meditation again. If you wish, if you're really enjoying the sitting and you feel you can carry on, please do. Otherwise, we'll have about 20 minutes of walking. And meet back here at three o'clock to sit together in silence for 20 minutes. So 20 minutes for walking and then a silent sitting together. And it's quite nice to sit together in silence. I feel that there is a different quality than sitting alone. So see if you can use this opportunity to just build up that beautiful kind awareness as you move into various postures. And as I said, at 3.20 after the next sitting, we will have a cup of tea break. <laughs> okay. I think we're keeping the videos on. So if you stay in the meeting, that is helpful for the hosts. So you can turn your video off if you wish. You don't.